Hi folks, there are a variety of different quantities that are measured in electricity. And these are current, voltage, resistance, and power. And in this video and the next, we're going to talk about these quantities, what they measure, and uh, exactly what they tell about our circuit or our situation. So in this video, we're going to concentrate on current and voltage, and then the next one, we're going to talk about resistance and power. Electric current is the speed or the rate at which charge flows through a substance. How quickly does that charge move through whatever conductor it's traveling through? The unit of electric current is the ampere, and it's very often abbreviated as amps. If you read the back of a, an appliance, very often it will say so many amps or so many milliamps. One ampere is equivalent to one coulomb per second. Now, what the heck is a coulomb? A coulomb is a quantity of charge. It is the charge on 6.24 times 10 to the 18th electrons. Um, that is a huge number of electrons, and why in the world did we even bother with such a thing? Well, electrons are so tiny, and one electron and the charge on one electron is so tiny. So they have chosen this number based on a variety of different experiments, and it is sort of like saying a dozen. A dozen means 12, um, and it is a convenient way of counting large numbers. Those of you who have taken chemistry, one mole of something is 6.02, 2 times 10 to the 23rd atoms, and it is a convenient way of talking about a large number of things. A coulomb is a convenient term that means a bucket full of charge. So this is a specific large quantity of charge. And if one bunch of charge called a coulomb passes a point in one second, that is equivalent to one ampere of electric current. And one ampere happens to be a relatively large quantity of charge. Now exactly how electric current flows through an electrical conductor um, it's very often described as water going through a hose or a pipe. And one of the things I want you to understand, if you have a garden hose and you first turn the hose on, there is usually water already in that pipe. And when you turn the hose on, water goes in and water comes out. But it's not necessarily the first water out is not necessarily the water that came in. Um, there's already water in the hose. And it works the same way with electric current. There are electrons in your conductor. And when current flows, what happens is there is a negative end and a positive end. And like charges repel, so the negatives are going to want to get away from other negatives. And what happens is this negative charge bumps into that one. He bumps into his brethren. He bumps into that one. And these little charges bump one into the other, and it's not like one little electron travels from here all the way to the other end. He doesn't. What happens is the push from one to another to another to another to another, and then the last one boop, pushes out the other end, and that amount of energy is dispelled out the other end of the conductor. So it's not exactly the same as water coming out of a hose. It's more like one object pushes against another, and that's how current flows through a, a wire. How fast does electric, electric current flow through a wire? Very often a number of about one-third the speed of light, which is very crazy fast, uh, one times 10 to the eighth meters per second. So it is a very quick way for electrical energy to get from one place to another via these multiple electrical repulsions. This amp is an indicator of the strength and the danger of the electric current. Just to give you some ideas of different amperages of different appliances, a clock radio can have an amperage of 0.83 amps or 830 milliamps. Uh, a television set, an LED TV, can be 2.5 amps. That's quite a bit. A hair dryer is a pretty benign little thing you'd imagine, but it's two to five amps. Appliances that produce a lot of heat 
tend to have higher amperages. Water heater, 16 to 21 amps, so it can be a very high amperage device. The human heart is an electrical pump, and it takes a very small quantity of electricity to stop that heart from pumping in its normal rhythm. So 100 milliamps or 0.10 regular amps is enough to disrupt the electrical rhythms of a heart and stop its normal rhythm and create death. So you're, you, that's why you have to protect your heart from electrical charges. Um, and uh, that is a good thing because of the fact that our skin is a good electrical insulator and that protects us from an awful lot of electrical charges. Now, voltage is more correctly a measurement of electrical potential. And electrical potential is defined as the difference in electrical potential energy between any two points per coulomb of charge. Now, remember, a coulomb of charge is a bunch of charge. It is a little group of charge, like a dozen or a mole or a, a little wad of electrons, if you want to think of them as a little ball of them or a little cluster of them. And voltage measures the difference in electrical potential energy between any two points if you have a little cluster of charge. One volt is equivalent to one joule of energy per coulomb, per little bunch of these electrical charges. And I think the easiest way to explain voltage is to go back to our old friend, gravitational potential energy. And gravitational potential energy is equivalent to mass, height, acceleration of gravity. So if I have a mass and it's sitting on the ground and I raise it away from the ground by some sort of height, I give it some stored potential energy that is equivalent to its mass times the height I have raised it times the fact that it is in the Earth's gravitational field. Now, it has this energy because it is stored up here. If I let this mass go and it goes and it falls back down, this potential energy can be transformed back into kinetic energy, which is motion, and along the way it can do work. Now, if you remember the physics definition of work, work is defining as exerting a force through a distance and it can do work on stuff. It can exert a force through a distance. It can move stuff. It can create heat. It can produce light. It can produce motion. Well, electrical potential energy is very similar. If I have a coulomb of charge, a little bundle of charge, just like this mass, and if this charge happens to be positive, it's happy, happy, happy next to all of these negative charges. But if I lift it doo -doo 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 -doo, in this electric field, so my positive coulomb of charge is next to a bunch of positives, it doesn't want to be there because it's like repels like. But if I hold it there so it cannot move, it has some electrical potential energy, and we refer to that as voltage. It has the potential to do work. And that potential we measure as the voltage. If I let it go and it goes because of the fact that positive charges want to move towards negative charges, as it moves from here to there, it can do work. And the work that it does can be producing heat or light or motion. And those moving charges can then transform one form of energy, potential energy, into other forms of energy. Now, this electrical potential or voltage in a battery, an electrochemical cell, you've got a positive end, you've got a negative end. So let's say we have a negative charge. We have a bunch of electrons that are here, and they want to get to here. Air is a crummy conductor, and they can't get from here to there easily. But we hook up a wire, and we put a light bulb in its place. So what happens is as the electrons flow from here, to there, we make them do some work, discharge some of their energy, make some light as they go to the positive end of the terminal, and they can do some work. Work, remember, is 
expelling energy or that energy can be used when it does work, exert a force through a distance. Your wall outlet, one plug is positive, the other plug is negative. Between these two prongs, there is electrical potential or voltage. And as you plug it in, it completes the circuit and as circuit and as it goes through your SpongeBob toaster, it does this and it will do work going from one to the other. And the work it does can, in this case, produce heat and the heat will give you a cool little SpongeBob image on your piece of toast. Now, there are a variety of different electrical chemical cells out there that will produce electrical potential or voltage. Um, and a cell is an chemical reaction that has been placed inside of a little can so that we can transport it easily from place to place. A dry cell is one that does not slosh when you move it around. The batteries that you and I buy at our favorite store, A's, double A's, triple A's, D cells, C cells, these are typically 1.5 volt. Um, these little batteries are typically all 1.5 volts, and these are single-celled devices. Now, the difference between a D cell and a double A or triple A battery is size. The bigger, that just means there's more chemicals involved and they're going to last longer. So the manufacturer chooses the size based on what gizmo they're building and also how much total energy is going to be needed in that chemical cell to run the device. A wet cell battery is what you have inside of your car. The wet cells ha are capable or commonly have a different chemical reaction that will produce a different electrical potential. Wet cells, each cell will produce on average about 2.1 volts. And in a car battery, you don't just have one cell, you have a battery of them. Now, the term battery is an old military term from the 16, 1700s, and it referred to a battery of cannons. You'd line one up after another, and that's what re was referred to as a battery. So they would line up one after another of these cells, and you would have multiples in one place. For example, this 6-volt, often referred to as a lantern battery, actually contains four 1.5-volt cells. And four times 1.5 volts gives you 6 volts. This 9-volt battery is actually made up of six electrochemical cells. It is, they're all tiny, small cells, but you can have six individual cells in a small package. So you want a lot more voltage, but a tiny package. And that's what a nine volt contains. A 12.6 volt automobile battery is made of one, two, three, four, five, six electrochemical cells. And the cells are all daisy chained together in series to give you the entire 12.6 volts for your automobile. Voltage is an indicator of the energy per electron. So it's possible to have a very, very high voltage, but low current. So few electrons there are going to pass a point per second. So the classic example of this is a spark jumping from your finger to a doorknob. It takes 25,000 volts to jump one inch in dry air. And it might look like a lot, but that's not going to stop your heart. That's not going to mess with your pacemaker. That is not an awful lot of voltage. On the other hand, if you have high voltage and you have high current, holy moly guacamole, that's going to be a lot. And for example, lightning can be over 100 million volts, plus you can have thousands of amps of current and the combination of high voltage and high current is what can kill you. And that can be a bad, bad day. All right, that will do for this one. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.